Okay, hi, I'm Bruce Payette. Um, in this talk, we're going to go through, uh, we'll try to trace the evolution of PowerShell from uh, the very beginning up until I run out of energy and we run out of time, because this is a 45 minute talk with three hours of content. Um, I want to look at some of the cultural, uh, technical, and some of the business forces. Um, there, are, there are artifacts in the source code in particular that have been impacted by uh, uh, some business decisions in the past. Um, this is the first round of, of at least two rounds of this talk. Uh, the ultimate goal is to gather all this information together into a document that will go on GitHub so that when people come, it'll become part of the contributors package so that you can deeply understand uh, what we're doing with PowerShell and why we're doing it that way. Uh, and hopefully that will help people more easily evolve the language um, in a coherent way. So in the beginning, things always start there. Uh, so PowerShell started in 2001. I joined uh, Microsoft in uh, December of 2001. Um, there was a project that was being uh, funded out of the India Development Center, IDC, uh, in Hyderabad, India, uh, to investigate the idea of a new shell. Um, the code name at the time was Kermit, because the person who was organizing this project had a child who had a kid's book about Kermit the Hermit Crab who lost his shell. That, I think we kept the Kermit name for about six months. Uh, it does not show up in the source code anywhere. Um, and it was staffed, the, the project was staffed by people coming from the Services for Unix team. Services for Unix uh, was, par part of Services for Unix was a product called Interix, which was uh, an extended version of the POSIX subsystem for Windows that was almost fully Unix compliant. Uh, it made sense to have people who had some experience with the shell and utilities to actually do a new shell. Why did we do it? Um, given especially at the time Microsoft was very GUI-centric. Uh, the command line was pretty deprecated for a lot of stuff. Um, and so we had commissioned a survey that had gone out and asked people about doing automation on Windows. And the survey had returned the result uh, that it took 10 times as much effort, it took 10 times as long to do an automation, to automate something on Windows versus Unix, which is uh, a bad thing. Uh, because we started to care about uh, Linux and Unix a lot at that, at that time point, right? It was becoming a significant, uh, it was clear that it was gonna be a significant competitor in the future. And finally, there was a, a, an evolution in culture. Uh, we were moving away from the era where you could have one machine in your data center and, and you were good. Uh, the number of machines in the data centers was skyrocketing and automation was, was very important. So we have all of this going on. There's one thing that's really important that's missing and that's a certain gentleman sitting over there, Jeffrey. Where's Jeffrey in all of this? Because he wasn't actually involved in the Shell project at the time. Um, however, he was over in Building 42, uh, madly prototyping a new type of command line based on some radically different set of, uh, ra radically different set of concepts. Um, a command line based on the composition of functional units, or FUs, um, for short, <laughs> uh, with an extended mutable type system. So you could describe a command line as being an FU, FU, FU. Um, and really get your anger out. Uh, this prototype was used a different model of composition than what eventually showed up in PowerShell. Um, if you look at, if you can see the, the line there, the, the second last code line from the bottom, um, I think we were still doing, I think we were doing uh, verb noun at the time, and the, the, the separator was a slash. Um, but the idea, conceptually, it was more a case you were doing extensions on existing commands uh, rather than composing a set of discrete commands. Uh, when we looked at it uh, as part of the design review, um, we decided we would go with something that was more, more similar to the traditional Unix model. I don't know that it was, there are uh, functional aspects that, that changed, um, but not so much from the prototype. Uh, and that's a, a discussion that's too long for now. So uh, Monad begins. Um, First thing we had was a bunch of guiding principles. Uh, if you haven't read it, I'd recommend reading the Monad Manifesto. It dates from that time, but it's surprisingly still very, very accurate. Um, and if you really want to understand what Jeffrey was thinking at the time, then this is a great document to read. Uh, we had a bunch of principles. Uh, easy to use is very important. Maybe more important than being simple. 
you needed to be able to get things done. You needed to be able to deal with sophisticated tasks in an effective way. And so if you needed uh, C Sharp, this is probably going to get me in trouble. C Sharp versus Visual Basic. Visual Basic is, is uh, very simple, uh, but you have to take a lot of steps to get something done. C Sharp or PowerShell, you can get stuff done uh, with uh, fewer steps, but, it's a, but it requires a little bit more sophistication. So we wanted it to be easy to use for the sophisticated user. But learning is also very important, and it's hard, right? So we need to uh, facilitate learning and, and protect that investment. Um, this is the sacred vow that Jeffrey talks about. If you learn something, you won't have to unlearn it. Uh, and one of the big drivers on this was consistency. So if you learned a principle once, then you'd be able to apply that principle over and over and over again. Um, the one thing we wanted to avoid was the foolish consistency where, where uh, everything would look like itself. And there's, there are still a couple of cases in, in, maybe a couple of cases in the language where, where we were a little foolish. Um, we also wanted to address the, uh, the tension between uh, whippetuppetude, which is a Perl word, and production coding. Uh, the survey had said that, that sort of ad hoc automation was very important for Windows. So the ability to write small scripts or even doing things on the command line was really important, uh, which implies the ability to do a lot of stuff on the command line uh, versus production coding where you want to be able to support the, the code that you're producing down the road. Uh, this results in a very wide dynamic range in the language, and there's a lot of ands, right? So methods and commandlets, simple functions and uh, advanced functions, uh, one of Jeffrey's favorites, uh, uh, command line and GUI. Um, uh, we, did, we also have uh, some features that uh, let you sort of scale your syntax with things like aliases and short options. So you can have, you have the line at the top, which is the fully elaborated line, and it's very readable because everything's fully spelled out. Uh, and then the line at the bottom, which is, I think, a little less than half the length of the, uh, the top line, is the same command, but condensed. So much quicker to type. The bottom line is good for the command line and, and doing quick things. It's not recommended for putting into a script. Uh, reuse, it's super important, right? Uh, we wanted to leverage reuse as much as possible, sort of an uh, uh, extreme reuse, uh, if you will. So common argument processing for all commands, ubiquitous parameters, uh, common runtime services like the way wildcards are processed, the way paths are resolved, and so forth. Uh, all those services are made available by the PowerShell runtime to people who are writing commandless or scripts. Uh, common formatting and outputting. Nobody has to write uh, formatting code in their commandlet. We take care of that for you. Uh, another one, people time is more important than processor uh, or disk, processor time or disk space. At the time, everybody was, it was reasonable to have a whole system to yourself. Uh, so throwing away resources to make the user faster was a non-issue. Uh, that's changed a little bit with uh, multiple VMs on a, on a physical machine uh, with IoT and re resource constrained environments. Uh, so some of the earlier decisions that we made regarding resource consumption are biting us a little bit now uh, as we move into these more constrained spaces. Uh, and you can see some of PowerShell v6 where we're, we're evolving and reducing some of the footprint. Um, we wanted to provide friction on negative paths. Uh, to use a probably incorrect uh, analogy, uh, we'll let you shoot yourself in the foot, but we won't hold the gun. So, uh, so we have um, dash force, on, on destructive operations. Uh, we, use, we have the whole dash confirm mechanism to confirm, again, operations that are gonna make significant changes to your system. Uh, and just in general, we wanted to have uh, uh, aspects of the system that let you do something but didn't make it easy if it was probably the wrong thing to do. You had to think about doing the wrong thing. We wanted to facilitate experimentation. It should be safe to try out commands. And so we have the what if ubiquitous parameter. Uh, and then we have declarative uh, annotations for commands and their parameters. So the logic for binding parameters and doing, command, uh, doing checking and so forth is done declaratively through a set of attributes rather than everybody writing their own null checks. Uh, the project begins and we acquire a team. I said it started out of uh, IDC in Hyderabad. Um, 
the architectural owners were all here in, in Redmond, uh, but the dev team was going to be in India because, uh, well, for a bunch of reasons. Uh, but it turns out that radical experimentation does not flourish with this level of uh, geographic distribution. Uh, at the time, it's, it's 12 hour time difference, so there, uh, we were awake and there was 12 and a half, um, depending on daylight savings time. Uh, so, and we were just using mail at the time to, to communicate and occasionally uh, uh, video conferencing. So uh, it wasn't a great environment. I think it might be better now, now that we have better tools for communication, we have GitHub and so forth, that, that uh, geographically distributed uh, development uh, might succeed where it didn't work for us then. Um, so anyway, that didn't work. Um, we, uh, first we pulled back uh, development with the idea that tests could still be there, but then even that really wasn't working very well because of the, uh, the a day lag on everything. Uh, because things were changing so fast. So um, that didn't work out. Uh, we went shopping and we acquired another team. Um, this one was built out of team members from the Windows Management Pack team, uh, which was great because they had a lot of management experience for Windows. So now we have a team we can begin for real. Oh yeah, and be ready to ship in two weeks. This was all in the Longhorn time frame. Does anybody remember Longhorn? So my, my, my impression of, long, of the Longhorn time frame was that Microsoft was starting to dip into the idea of continuous delivery. Uh, I could be wrong, but that's sure what it looked like because we were supposed to be ready to ship every two weeks. Um, so it was exciting. Um, we, were, we, were not, we did not have the infrastructure to support this kind of thing. Uh, oh. I'm now lost in my slides. Okay. Uh, anyway, this was clearly not an ideal situation. We would have shipped a PowerShell that had almost no features um, that would have been not much more than Jeffrey's prototype, uh, which was disturbingly functional. You know, but, but still, it would have been missing a lot of the elements of a, of a shell. Like, uh, you wouldn't be able to write scripts in it, which shell scripting language kind of need to do that. Um, so it didn't happen. That's good. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, so now let's talk about some of the big ideas. Uh, big ideas are, so we talked about the principles, and they're very sort of generic principles. The big ideas are more architectural characteristics of the engine, um, more concrete than abstract. So one big idea um, is the idea of domain-specific vocabularies. So PowerShell was going to have, you would, you would basically write a set of words. Um, if anybody's familiar with the fourth language, there's this notion of, of domain-specific vocabularies where you would write a set of words for your domain environment. And, this is different from a domain-specific language in that there are no syntactic elements that are different. It's just a set of, of nouns and verbs uh, within your, your uh, uh, application domain. So we encourage the use of a constraint set of, of verbs. We didn't enforce it at this point. We didn't start doing anything around enforcement until version two. Um, uh, guidelines on which verbs to use. Uh, this made it very predictable. With a small set of verbs, you can, the user can infer if I need to get something, I probably need to use the word get instead of fetch or whatever. Um, uh, yes, we did explore one. Uh, uh, the set of verbs has grown slightly over the years, but not very much. Um, I think we've only added a handful of verbs since the very beginning, which is kind of amazing, given how long ago it was that we were doing this. Um, so we had verb pairings, start, stop, get, set. Uh, again, prescriptive uh, so that the user could, again, if the user uh, knew that there was a start verb, then they can infer that there's a stop verb. Um, and then command aliases for interactive use, uh, again, so the whippet upitude thing. Uh, where there are two types of, of aliases. Uh, there are the canonical aliases, like GCI for get child item, which are specific to PowerShell. And then there are the convenience aliases like ls or dir. Um, this worked pretty well in Windows, um, but kind of got us into trouble when we, when we moved to uh, uh, Mac OS and Linux because we were now hiding some of the existing commands on those platforms, um, especially curl. Curl was a big problem. 
So big idea, universal command line parsing. Uh, unlike most shells, the commandlets are not responsible for doing their own parsing. The common parser code does that. Uh, it breaks everything into and, um, breaks everything into data structures that then get passed to command type specific parameter binders. So advanced functions or commandlets each have their own parameter binder, and you can find all of those things in uh, uh, under the engine subdirectory of the SMA directory in GitHub. So you want to take a look at how the parameter binders work. Uh, this approach gives us broad consistency across commands. Uh, commands always have always uh, have a dash. Um, they can always be separated by spaces and so forth. Uh, this works really, really well uh, for all of our command types except native commands, that is, executables, because they still do their own command parsing. They, they take the argument string that they're passed and then they parse it up into arguments. And so native command binder had to uh, take his arguments and then, and then turn them back into a string, kind of like what we think the user meant when he typed them. Uh, this works okay sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't. Uh, there are a couple of bugs in GitHub uh, around this, and we're trying to fix them. We've, we've, we've fixed some, uh, but it's very, they're kind of hacks. Uh, they're, they're not appealing from an architectural perspective, but they do make the user's experience better. So this is one of these cases where it's not quite the foolish consistency, but uh, being super consistent uh, makes it the end user's experience a little rough. Declarative parameter constraints, uh, rather than uh, writing imperative code to do all the checking, we have attributes to deal with that. Um, these attributes did a couple of things. One, they reduced the amount of code you had to write. Uh, and two, they reduced the amount of error messages you had to write and internationalize and so on and so forth. And it also eliminated or reduced the number of error messages that the user had to learn. So there were, this was a win-win-win situation, um, except when it didn't work. Uh, so you, get, you can get into situations that are suboptimal, like the regular expression uh, validate pattern, um, where it tells you the regu regular expression that was like regular expression for a phone number. Uh, it doesn't tell you your phone number is invalid. It tells you it's some like strange sequence of characters gobbledygook that that is not right, or you're not matching this pattern. Um, so it doesn't. It's not a great uh, user experience if you use that that particular attribute. And then sometimes this whole idea of attributes just didn't work. This is a comment uh, out of the, the process, get process, set process, test process, uh, get process, start process commands in the source code. Uh, basically, <laughs> the process name glob, glob attribute was deeply wrong. Uh, I think it's a particularly funny comment. I'm removing this comment from the code, by the way. It, it does have the programmer's name associated with it, so I'm taking it out. Providers. Um, so we were sitting around in a conference room discussing how many get commands we were going to need. And then somebody, and I don't remember who it was exactly or whether it was simultaneous invention, decided that, wait a second, if we had a standard set of commandlets and just created this sort of pluggable model for hierarchical data stores, then we only have to have one get command because it'll work for all of the stores. And, and so uh, we developed the, the what are called the core commandlets uh, item, child item, item property, et cetera. Uh, and these sit on top of the providers, which are in the source code, they're called namespaces. So if you want to see how all the providers work, uh, look at that location, SMA slash namespaces. Uh, again, in the, in the uh, effort to be consistent, uh, we decided that everything could be access to providers. So file system makes sense. Registry is a hierarchical store. Sure, that makes sense. Functions, okay, that's a little strange. Uh, and variables and the environment. And things that, like the WSMAN configuration, although it doesn't come until version two, um, could all be exposed through the same set of commandlets. So you could navigate to the, into these stores uh, using uh, CD, basically. Um, and basic provider options are also available through the, the variable syntax. So this was kind of dual ported. Uh, you can, for example, define a function by assigning a script block into a name in the function drive. Uh, Uh, big, big idea, the extended type system. Uh, we wanted to build uh, a management-oriented type system. Uh, and, and we were going to layer it on top of the existing .NET type system. We had a wild dream of this idea of a central type, uh, type extension system where you'd be able to publish uh, patches to the, running, to the type system of the running code. Uh, it was very cool. It didn't happen. 
Uh, I leave this as an exercise to the audience. Uh, we worked with a variety of teams at the time, and a lot of people, not just PowerShell team, a lot of, a lot of people thought this was kind of a good idea, having this management layer on the type system. And so we worked with, uh, with them about doing some of the designs, but ultimately uh, it got lost in the uh, uh, world of schedules, I suppose you could say. Uh, and so as near as I can remember, there's only one actual result, and that's the fact that, that arrays have a dot count property in PowerShell, and they don't in .NET. So that you can always say dot count on a collection and get a, get a number back. Um, we also had the synthetic type system. This supported the idea of deserialized objects. So objects that, uh, an object, a deserialized object remembers what it used to be, not what it, it doesn't, doesn't deserialize as the original type because the, the original type might not exist on that system anymore, but you can still work with that type um, because it remembers what it used to be. Um, and we also allowed you to create new custom objects uh, that, were, that didn't have a type associated with. You couldn't construct types. Uh, you couldn't construct types dynamically in, in the CLR in version one or version two, I guess it was. Uh, anyway, um, but we didn't let you construct types. Big idea, PS object. This has come up a bit lately on some of the GitHub issues. Um, Jeffrey's original type system only allowed you to do uh, class-specific extensions. Um, but we also had scenarios where we wanted to be able to extend an individual object, attach information to an object. Uh, and so we have PS object. PS object is a class that wraps instances of other objects and holds all of their extensions. Um, so no properties, script properties, code properties are all wrapped in the PS object. Um, it simplifies a bunch of things because you always go through PS object. Uh, but it also makes some, some things complex um, because you have to always deal with the PS object. C sharp code that takes, uh, that has a parameter of type object has to deal with a PS object just in case and then get the underlying object if it needs to. Uh, PS object is mostly intended to be invisible to the script user, but is not entirely invisible to the, uh, to the script user. So it is part of the PowerShell API, which is part of the overall PowerShell user's experience, just to be really clear about that. But most of the time, you don't need to worry about it. And then we have the, the typeless objects I mentioned earlier, uh, the PSS, PS custom object type. This ability to cast um, hash tables into custom objects is a V3 thing, I think. Um, but you could still do it in, in V1 with add, uh, add member. Um, it was just harder. The implementation. Uh, so the initial design was highly componentized. Most of the components uh, in the source code, they live in system that management that automation slash engine. So you'll find pretty much all of the pieces of the core PowerShell runtime in, the, in that directory or subdirectories. Some of the pieces include, uh, well, in version one, it was run space configuration, uh, which was all a set of initial commands that you had in your, in your run space when you started up. Um, well, yeah. Uh, run space configuration, largely supplanted by uh, initial, state, st uh, initial session state starting in v2. Um, the, the language, the tokenizer parser, and all of the execution stuff uh, was there. Execution context, which includes all of the stores. So aggregating all of the, the various provider instances into one single object. Uh, pipeline processor is the piece that runs pipelines, kind of obviously. Uh, and then there's all the uh, command processors that are associated with that. And finally, there's the error handling subsystem. Uh, the problem with this design is that you basically, you, you had a bunch of Lego blocks and you basically had to build your own shell. And it was not super trivial. Um, it, it required a certain amount of understanding of how the pieces went together. Uh, it meant you could do a very minimal shell. I mean, you could have, in theory, you could have uh, the pipeline processor without the engine or without the language at all. So you'd have a very minimal shell. You could have something that didn't have the language, that didn't have uh, most of session state, that didn't have formatting and outputting, and it would be, give you a relatively small footprint. Um, anyway. Uh, to deal with the complexity, we decided that we would bundle everything together into uh, an Uber class called the run space. Um, and what is a run space? A run space is a, is a space where you run things. It, I've never understood why people find that hard, but people found it hard enough that we have a wrapper class called a session. 
of remoting that sits on top of a run space. And the run space sits on top of something called automation engine, which, uh, so it's kind of turtles all the way down. Um, yeah, and then, and then the, uh, the run spaces are exposed through the APIs, but not necessarily through the shell level. Context objects, so execution context. I said, I said we had session that included a run space that included an automation engine that included, and it also included a context object. Context object were all the, all the resources that, that the running engine needed, and it got passed around all over the place. So every, every node in the, uh, in the expression tree uh, of the compiled language had to get this thing. Um, eventually, it got to the point where uh, it was just too much trouble to keep passing it from class to class to class to class. So we ended up sticking it into uh, a thread local storage, thread local variable, uh, and it's accessible through uh, uh, get execution context from TLS. Get a fairly straightforward name, uh, but that's, you'll see that in the code in a number of places. Uh, you'll, see, you'll see execution context all over the place, and then you'll see people calling this API to get their execution context. Um, execution, the execution context that's inside the engine is not the same as the execution that you, context object that you see in dollar execution context because that is a facade object that only shows through part of the public parts of that object. Um, we'll talk about design patterns in a minute. Uh, command provider context did the same thing for providers. It provided all the provider, provider context. Um, by wrapping everything up into the context objects, though, this gave us the ability to do multiple run spaces per, per uh, process or per app domain if you're a stickler for details. Uh, this means that we can do parallel execution. We can do run space pools. We can do all those things. Um, and this was, I'm not sure how super deliberate it was. I mean, it was, uh, yeah, I guess it was. <laughs> it's sort of just something we did because it seemed obvious rather than being, uh, oh yeah, we should do this. So lots of design patterns I talked about. Um, we used design, it was the era of Gang of Four patterns. We used a lot of design patterns uh, fairly informally throughout PowerShell, the PowerShell source code, PowerShell design. Um, we have adapter pattern in the type adapters. So we have a type adapter for various like data stores. Uh, .NET objects, synthetic objects, uh, all have, have type adapters. We use the facade pattern a lot uh, for making all of the commands look similar. Um, we use delegation in the command binders. So the command processor orchestrates the commandlet, but it doesn't do the commandlet binding. It uses a separate uh, delegated class to do that. And the, delegated, the commandlet binder, for example, is used both by commandlets, obviously, and by advanced functions. Um, we have factory pattern in the, uh, uh, the run space factory, um, strategy pattern in command discovery as to how we go about finding commands. Uh, so again, if you're going through the source code, um, you'll see a lot of, uh, a lot of the stuff should look familiar because of all of the user patterns. It should be relatively easy to figure out the role of the different objects uh, in, the, in the running process. Okay, now we get to the PowerShell language. Now, as I mentioned earlier, in the original architecture, the language was actually conceived of as being completely separate from the PowerShell engine. You would be able to not have the language or even plug in another language. Um, somebody had, at one point, had expressed interest in doing a, a command, uh, command.exe style language for PowerShell, um, but that didn't happen. I say that a lot. Uh, in practice, the language has become pretty deeply mixed into everything because it's recursively used. And the language uses the pipeline, which uses the formatting system, which uses the language. Uh, so it, it, it's pretty difficult to separate now. But I think one of the reasons for making it separate is we weren't sure that the language was going to be right. Um, we had grave concerns about that early on. Uh, I think we're okay with it now. It's only been 16 years, I think we're fine. The language roots, where did it start? We started with the IEEE POSIX.2 shell grammar, which is essentially the corn shell, which is more or less bash, which all come from the born shell. Um, POSIX stood for portable operating system interface with an X on the end, because it sounds cool. Um, the official designation. Uh, 
There are big changes to the implementation, though, because, and I'll talk about that more in a second. Um, uh, but we tried to stick to the POSIX grammar as much as possible. Um, we actually had a, a YAC grammar uh, that we started with. Um, and for a long time, I think uh, Jim Truer, who was the PM, was maintaining the, the language grammar uh, in, in YAC uh, and, and trying to update it. Um, of course, part of the problem is that PowerShell is not a context-free grammar. There are a lot of deals between the parser and the tokenizer, and tokens have different meanings depending on their context, so you can't really represent that type of grammar in YAC. And so after so many, I don't know how many shift-reduced conflicts he had, uh, he gave up. We tried actually using other grammar tools to capture the grammar, and, and so far we have not, not succeeded. Um, but it's written, the, the, the source code is written in, the way, in such a way that you can infer the grammar from the, from the code. It actually has comments. All of the different parsing rules have comments associated with them saying what they parse. So you, you used to be able to do a, a, a grep through the source code looking for slash slash g, and that would pull out all of the grammar, grammar comments. Um, I didn't think it's drifted from accuracy. So anyway, we started with, with the posit shell. Um, the parameter syntax, though, we, was uh, inspired to a large extent uh, by DCL, deck command language, uh, courtesy of Jeffrey. Uh, so we have the long options, the use of colon. Uh, I think those are the primary components. Right, but that's different from the Unix shell that uses one character options or double dashes for long options and so forth. But it makes for a very readable uh, shell. Then there were a whole bunch of concepts that we wanted to have that weren't in the POSIX shell. Um, so we started by adapting uh, uh, elements of Perl. Uh, at the time, Perl was pretty much the dominant scripting language uh, on the internet. Uh, Perl had arrays, Perl had hash tables, it had regular expressions, all of the things that we wanted. Uh, super significant is that Perl had CPAN, the, uh, which was the archive of modules. The, 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 Joke at the time was that CPAN was the language of the internet and Perl was just syntax. And it was critically important to the success of Perl at the time. Um, and we have retained some syntactic elements from, from Perl. Uh, we used dollar underbar, which is the pipeline operator that fell over. Just remember that, pipeline over, falls over. If you want to explain why it is the way it is. Um, we use that in a bunch of places. Uh, so in, in array sub expressions, uh, in the null, null array, uh, or the sort of empty array. Uh, we use the ampersand for our call operator. Uh, we use regular expressions all over the place, but uh, not much else from the language. And the reason is that, in, in the end, Perl is kind of icky as a language. It, it also grew up from, from a shell background, um, but it didn't sort of rethink its things terribly clearly. Uh, at any point. Uh, I haven't looked at the Perl 6 grammar these days. It might be cleaner. But uh, at the time, with Perl 4 or 5, uh, you could basically dump arbitrary text into it, and it would be a valid script, right? You know, line noise should not compile. We wanted people to be able to distinctly tell whether their script was valid or not. Um, so we switched our syntax model to align with C sharp which essentially means that we're aligning to everybody else that derives from C, like, uh, which coincidentally also includes Perl. Uh, so that's sort of ironic. And our value proposition became, in part, that uh, if you learn PowerShell, then you could move to C Sharp. Uh, you, should, you should be able to reuse a lot of your knowledge in C Sharp. Um, and likewise, if you knew C Sharp, then you should be able to pick up PowerShell uh, pretty easily. So again, we want to protect the students' investments. Uh, learning is hard. Um, not entirely sure how well this worked uh, because uh, I see people who keep wanting I see people who keep wanting to turn PowerShell into into C sharp, uh, which is a little weird. Uh, it's not like C sharp's great, but it exists. Why would we do that? Um, This is not your parental unit shell. I'm being gender agnostic here. Uh, so all, almost all shells are expand and parse. How many people know what an expand and parse shell or what an expand and parse means? I see a few hands. Yeah, so the idea of an expand and parse shell is that the shell reads, the, reads your script. It doesn't read your whole script. It reads your script or it processes your script line by line. 
It reads the line. It goes through and it does variable expansion. So it turns all, all of the variables get expanded and that gives you a new string back. Um, and then it goes through and it tokenizes that string. Um, so uh, the first position in the, in the tokenized string is always the command. So if you had a dollar sign, like if you had a variable dollar command in, in the original source string uh, during the expansion phase, that would have expanded into a command name. Uh, and so by the time you parse it to, that, that expanded name is the one you execute. So you can say dollar foo and just run, run whatever dollar foo points to in, a, in a, an expanded parse shell. You can't do that in PowerShell. Um, PowerShell, on the other hand, parses the entire script. So the whole script is read in. It is parsed from beginning to end. It's parsed once. Um, again, expanded parse shells, expanded parse every time it hits a line. Uh, PowerShell reads the whole thing once, it parses it once, and builds, um, well, in version one, it built an expression tree that is an, execu an executable representation of the script. In PowerShell v2, it builds uh, a proper abstract syntax tree that has most of the pieces, most of the elements of the syntax are captured in the tree. And then that, that tree is used for execution. Um, and so if the user types the same command, but with an ampersand at the beginning because we need the call operator, uh, it parses to um, call and then variable command. So it, it, you have a node in the, in the tree that says this is a, a variable expression, right? So you have these expressions in the tree. Uh, and the variable has not been expanded at this point. It won't be expanded until runtime. So then you take that representation and you execute it. And it goes through that there and it recursively walks through the thing. It says, okay, my, this, is, this is my command. Um, these are my arguments. Okay, let me see if I have to evaluate the arguments. Oh yes, this is a variable argument. I'll evaluate that argument and substitute the string in. The string will become the argument all the way through the rest of the arguments. Um, so this, this produces a bunch of things, a bunch of significant differences from a traditional shell, not the call operator is one. Um, one of the ones that's kind of annoying is that uh, it restricts what aliases can do. So aliases, again, it's all, com it's all compiled once. So uh, the alias, aliases get expanded at runtime, not at compile time, because you'd never be able to change the alias in your compile script if it got expanded at, at uh, uh, compile time. Um, and the other thing is it can, it can only resolve to a command name, and you can't have fragments of grammar in there. In the example with the expanded parse shell, I could have, could have had something that said um, ls space dash l could have been the value in uh, the variable foo and, or do, variable command. And then it would actually parse into two arguments. So you're actually doing kind of an eval on, on the resulting string. Um, but we needed to do this. We needed to have this different approach because we're dealing with objects everywhere. And we'll see that in a second. Right. Uh, splatting. Um, this was designed to solve, or was added to solve the commands calling commands problem. In a lot of places, you have a command that wants to then call a subcommand with the same parameters that were passed to it. Um, and so splatting does that. Right? You, take, you, you get your PS bound parameters uh, variable and you do at PS bound parameters to the, the call the child command. Splatting comes from Ruby. It's in other languages I know. Um, I got it from Ruby. Um, just to clear that up, because it matters to me for some reason. Um, we use the, but Ruby uses the asterisk uh, to, to indicate a splatted variable. We use the at symbol, uh, because the asterisk is a glob, right? If I wanted to have, if I wanted to, exp I'm, on, I'm doing my command, you know, my command space, asterisk, foo, well, that's a glob expression. Um, if I wanted to pass a variable, we see at something or other. So we needed, we needed to use a different uh, uh, sigil character uh, to distinguish it from globbing expressions. Script blocks and the call operator. I've talked about this a little bit. We needed the uh, call operator um, because, because we're not an expand and partial. I need the call operator to be able to do an indirect call through uh, an expression. Um, so, uh, and this includes things like commands with spaces that have parens around it because that's an expression. Uh, the script blocks grew in a strange way. Um, there was a gentleman on the MMC team who came to me and said, 
look, we're, we're going to want to use PowerShell, but we need to have this idea of, of isolated fragments of code. Um, is there a way you can do that? And I thought, well, we don't have a way to do that now, but I have heard of this thing that might work. Um, and so you know, this seems like a job for a Lambda function. Uh, and so we introduced script blocks using uh, paren notation, block notation. Um, Lambda notations uh, are much more common now. At the time, they were sort of notoriously known for being part of hard to use languages. It was this strange exotic thing that nobody understood. Uh, that would be a bad thing to do to our less than technical users. So uh, we wanted it to be more uh, amenable. And so they became script blocks rather than uh, lambdas. And uh, take, you know, take a look at an example with where Reacher 4. Um, it looks pretty natural. Most users are not aware that they're using a script block there or that it's anything strange. Um, so it's, it, script blocks are, are pervasive throughout the language runtime. Every piece of code gets compiled into a script block first. The, uh, when you run, run a, 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 a script, it gets built into a script block and then evaluated. Um, I mean, really, a, a script is nothing more than a script block on disk. You could read it into memory, compile it, with create script block and then evaluate it. Uh, they, are, they also allow things like delegates, um, which open up a whole bunch of, thing, uh, of areas of coding that we weren't able to do before. So um, we can do WinForms coding in PowerShell. So you can write GUIs in PowerShell. You can do XAML coding in PowerShell. Uh, you can even do stuff with the DOM and, and HTML if you really want to. Uh, so that opens up a, a whole range of possibilities that uh, wouldn't have been available otherwise. Yes? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the where, the where command was very complicated. And then, uh, well, it was very complicated. And then they got reduced down to, here's a script block, just execute it. Um, and then it got complicated again for the simple where. <laughs> Which is funny. Uh, be careful what you wish for, you might get it. Um, yeah, and then so we had to, again, this function example where, um, I mean, then there's a, it's a parameterized function because script blocks take parameters. And so you can do the fully the equivalent of a function definition with parameters and everything by assigning a script block into a variable or into a, um, well, into the function drive. So there's a bunch of language design questions that we had to deal with. Uh, first off, PowerShell is an expression-oriented language. Again, does it ring a bell with anybody? Total thumbs. So expression-oriented language is everything returns a value, which is what happens in PowerShell. So even something like a for each statement returns a value. Uh, the if statement returns a value, which is our argument against having the conditional operators. Um, uh, one difference from a lot of expression-oriented languages, though, is that it returns everything. Every statement, every line in a block of code returns a value. Uh, in a lot of languages, like Lisp, it's typically the, the value of, of a collection of code is the value of the last statement in that collection of code. And PowerShell is not. It's everything. Um, the original version of the interpreter actually worked the way I said the Lisp interpreter worked. It only returned the value of the last statement. But that's not very shell-like. Shells. Shells write to streams. Streams get aggregated uh, from every line within a function or a script. Um, lexical or dynamic scoping? This is another one. Uh, ring a bell? No. Lexical scoping is most common in programming languages these days. Dynamic scoping, uh, the original Lisp interpreters were dynamically scoped. Basically, what it means is, is when you're looking for a variable, you look in your, your scope, your immediate scope. And if it's not there, then you look in your caller scope. And if that's not there, then you look in the caller scope all the way up until you get to global scope. And this is basically how PowerShell works. Uh, it's, it's, it makes a bunch of things simple. Um, you typically, you, you can pass a whole bunch of context through, uh, through uh, uh, scoped variables rather than having to have a lot of parameters. Um, but it also makes things fragile, that, that you can have false coupling between uh, functions because a variable has leaked from the wrong place. So good for small programming in the small, not great for programming in the large. Um, we had discussions with some of the architects in, 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 the, in the CLR team. And they were like, oh, you're going to get it. 
if you go with dynamic parameters. But it, it, it has largely worked. And uh, one of the things that we did in V2 with modules is that we introduced this idea of module scope so that you don't leak into the, into the functions in the module. Um, should the option character be dash or slash? Uh, that was easy. We're competing against the Unix shell, not command.exe, so we'll go with the dash. Um, how to handle switches? Switches are parameters that are either present or absent. Uh, easy to deal with and expand and parse because you have a, if your variable is empty, if your variable is not empty uh, and contains a switch parameter, then the switch parameter is there uh, and it's, it's on. And if it's, the variable is empty, then the switch parameter is not there and it's off. Right? Again, that doesn't work in a fully parsed environment. Um, and so we needed a different mechanism. Um, we, uh, when we were doing, addressing this, we thought, well, they'll just be Booleans, right? Uh, but that, people wanted to use Booleans for a whole bunch of other things. Uh, it seemed like kind of a large space to co-opt. And so we enter, introduced this, this uh, new class, switch parameter, that has this characteristic of being present or absent um, and doesn't take an argument. Um, until it does, uh, because again, commands calling commands, uh, you do you do want to be able to pass through um, an argument to a, a, a script block or through a through a command through a switch parameter. Um, splatting and PS bound parameters made that a, a little bit less difficult, but it's still a case where in simple cases where you want to be able to pass it through. And. You'd think this would be obscure enough that people wouldn't use it by accident, um, but I've seen I've seen lots of people, lots of stuff online where people are putting in switch parameters colon dollar false. I have no idea where that's coming from. More language questions. So, expand and parse shells. They only deal with strings. All the arguments to a command are strings on the command line. And so it's up to the shell to figure out what, it, it's up to the individual command to figure out what that string is for, whether it's a number or a string or a file name. Um, but it means that, that everything just kind of like automatically works because the commands know what they want to do with strings. They have their own built-in parsers. Uh, in our environment, we don't want people writing all these custom parsers. We want to be able to pass real objects um, and so uh, that's a bit, the primary reason for having the fully parsed shell is that because the, because the variables are not expanded into text, they're, they're passed in as objects, uh, then we can get objects passed through to commandlets rather than expanding into, an, uh, some people thought this is what we were doing at first, is that we were expanding into this big ass XML string and then turning it back into an object inside, uh, which would have been horrendously slow. Um, but uh, we just pass in the, 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 the object itself. But then we still have this idea that uh, we want everything to just kind of work, right? You shouldn't have to worry about doing a lot of explicit conversions. How do we get the user experience with a type-based shell to be similar to that of a string-based shell? And the answer to that was super aggressive type conversions. So, uh, the runtime, when, when you're passing uh, stuff around, the runtime makes a lot of implicit guesses at uh, what you meant. Um, it, there, there is a constraint on the, uh, one of the things that we considered doing was having it automatically chain conversion. And then we realized that that was a bad idea because everything converts to string eventually. And so we'd be right back where we started from. Um, and so we don't do chaining, we don't do implicit chaining, but we can do explicit chaining. When we're doing this, we start. We use uh, an algorithm for searching for the converter uh, between the source type and the target type, and uh, we use a, an algorithm called the type distance algorithm, so that in ambiguous cases, uh, we we compute a distance between the target types, and whichever one has the whatever whichever one is is closest to the target uh, is the type conversion that we use. Uh, and I think that, that has been tweaked a little bit over time, but I think we're still using the same basic type conversion algorithm. So that's how generic type conversion work. Um, the parameter binder does not do this. So this is, this is one of the things that we, uh, in version one, said, well, we can ship it this way and we'll change it later. And 
you know, 10 years later, we haven't changed it. Um, so I don't think it's ever going to do. But anyway, binding in the, in the parameter binder is done in two passes. The first pass goes through and tries to do an exact match on each of the parameters. So if the, types are, the type of the argument and the type of the uh, parameter are the same, then it can simply bind the parameter. Um, and if that doesn't succeed, then it does a second pass uh, where, where it looks for a type conversion. So if there's a, a type conversion for uh, the, the explicit target type, um, the source type to the target type, then it can succeed and proceed with the bind. Uh, so everything is done twice. Uh, if you ever wonder why it's slow, well, that's one of the reasons why it's slow, is that it does this, this extremely complicated process uh, using bitmaps or uh, you know, bit fields to you know, determine the, the uh, degree of closeness of the, of the match and so on. It makes, it makes uh, parameter binding uh, uh, very heavyweight. But hey, we said we were not going to worry about CPU cycles and stuff back at the beginning. So this was designed to be, this was designed to give the best user experience uh, at the cost of significant resources. We'd like to fix that. We have some ideas. Uh, one of the things that we don't do right now in the parameter binder is we don't do, so, so the DLR runtime does um, type caching uh, or method caching, where it once it figures out how to do something, then it caches that. So the next time through, it says, if I'm still doing the same thing, I can use this mechanism that I've cached. We don't do that for the parameter binder today. We could, be, we could probably do that. So we do the expensive computation once and then cache the result. Uh, that would be fun. I'd like to work on that. Anybody else want to work on it? Um, how am I doing? Uh, I have allegedly no time at this point. So finally, we're near the end of what I was going to talk about today. Uh, so we, we have we built everything. It's all spiffy and cool. We have all these great ideas. Now we need to ship. Shipping is fun. PowerShell, because PowerShell started as an independent project inside Microsoft, it had its own build system. It had its own everything. Um, but later on, we shifted to be part of Windows. Windows has its own build system. So we switched from our build system to their build system. And they have a bunch of rules about how stuff looks, so we changed our stuff to look like their stuff. And then there's the Longhorn reset, and the world explodes. We were a brand new .NET co component, and we were kicked in some place in the anatomy out of, of Windows. Crap, now what? OK, so we're drifting aimlessly, and along comes the exchange team. Our best friends, our new best friends. <laughs> uh, they were investigating an automation solution for managing exchange servers. Uh, and PowerShell pretty much matched all of their requirements just by simultaneous invention, uh, which was very cool. Um, so this was awesome. We have a new development partner, a great development partner, because they gave us a lot of feedback, uh, very constructive. And uh, we have a new shipping vehicle. We can ship with, we can ship with the exchange shell. Uh, there's some impact on the product. Uh, first, the fact that the Longhorn reset kind of gave us a lot of time to work on things, and so PowerShell became much, much more refined than it might have been. Uh, so that was good. Um, uh, on the somewhat less good side was there was a focus on the exchange feature team features first, uh, and that meant that some of the things that uh, are applicable in general shells didn't get that much uh, attention. Um, native command support uh, is an example of that. So native command processor was barely there. I, I barely had time to get anything working uh, at, the, at the time frame. And it still sucks. And I know that Sergey Vorbev did a bunch of work uh, to get to slightly unsuck it um, for PowerShell 6. Uh, but it still needs a bunch more work. It still has parameter binding issues. Uh, the pipe doesn't work the way it should. Um, like you were sort of just barely able to launch Notepad. Uh, and that wasn't bad for Exchange, but it was bad for a, a general purpose shell. And uh, it's something I would, I would really like to make work uh, better. Shipping is fun three. So okay, we, get, we finally get approval to ship as a Windows feature, not as an Exchange feature. So now we're Windows PowerShell, not Exchange PowerShell, or Exchange Shell, or Exchange Monad, or whatever. Um, but we have to pass a bunch of Windows quality gates. So there are versioning requirements. 
there's a couple of ways you can go about doing versioning. You can have loose versioning, uh, also known as DLL hell. Um, or you can have rigid versioning, which is what the .NET team did with the GAC, and that is completely brittle. I mean, you'll never be wrong, but you might be useless. Um, so as, as Jeffrey says, this, this versioning is not a problem. Problems can be solved. Uh, this can be only mitigated. Um, part of it had to do with how the way we dealt with, with plugins. Uh, there was a no plugins requirement because IE was, well, IE was IE, and uh, it had lots of plugins, and it hung a lot. Um, I mean, it got to the point where there were fewer, there were fewer crashes. There were more hangs than crashes uh, in, the, in coming back from telemetry. And a lot of the hangs were in, in IE, not in the code itself, but in the plugins that people were writing. So there was a, a big push not to have new plugin architectures. And uh, DevDiv did a, 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 a big effort to come up with a, a how did I just describe it, a very, uh, resilient plugin architecture. Um, it was also complicated and heavyweight. Um, and so we looked at it, but it, it would have been wildly inappropriate for us. It was designed for the, the level of a component, not a commandlet. Um, but PowerShell is all about plugins. So we had to do something to meet, you know, to satisfy this requirement. Um, so our first attempt was uh, mini shells. So there wouldn't be one PowerShell. There would have been a PowerShell, and there would have been an AD PowerShell, and there would have been uh, an Exchange PowerShell, and there would have been everything. Because what you, what you would have had to do is you'd take the libraries for PowerShell, and you'd take your commandlets and some tooling, and out of this you would spit out a custom shell that included your commandlets hard linked in. Um, and so the only way to call from commandlet to commandlet would be from shell to shell. And there is a feature in PowerShell. Uh, if you type, if, if you're within PowerShell and you type PowerShell, open brace, like a script block, close brace, then that will be evaluated as an expression in the child shell. That was actually added to make many shells work uh, uh, tractably well. Um, I think is the only part of many shells that are left. All the tooling and everything else got cut ages ago. Um, <laughs> Exchange looked at this and said, no, <laughs> are you guys idiots? This is not going to work for us. We need to be able to extend our shell with some kind of plug-in mechanism. And so once again, we return to the, the halls of core, uh, Windows core architecture team, uh, supplicants on bended knee, begging for a solution. And uh, uh, since MMC already shipped with Windows, and it had snap-ins, we thought, OK, well, this is shipping, and it seems to be OK, so can we do this? And I think there was, there was a, diver a, a diverse set of opinions on the MMC snap-in mechanism uh, that are probably not publicly consumable. Um, <laughs> but they, uh, ultimately, they agreed that, that we could do the snap-in mechanism. And so we went off to do the snap-in mechanism uh, where you have to register the DLL and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and this still has dregs in the code. You can see it in, under system management automation, single shell. Uh, and there's another thing, single shell utilities. Um, they sort of left over from, I think, the reason it's called single shell is because we had mini shells, which was mini shells was many shells and single shells is one shell uh, with plugins. Um, so uh, we got approval for snap-ins. It was not optimal. But we could chip. Uh, that was one of the first things we went after in, in PowerShell v2. Ah, yes, the language reviews. Because PowerShell was the, is the only language product that ships outside of DevDiv. Um, so the developer division was a little concerned about this um, because at the time everybody, well, we were kind of siloed and everybody was protecting their products and making sure that we weren't confusing the user with the wrong thing and, and all the normal stuff that businesses do. All this, uh, used to do anyway. Um, so uh, we had to have a, a review with the CLR and the, the relatively newly formed DLR team. Um, one of the big issues was the architectural 
approach to passing objects through the pipeline. At the time, DevDiv was producing Link. And Link works by a composition of enumerators, and it pulls the objects through their pipeline. Uh, PowerShell, on the other hand, uh, the pipeline processor pushes the objects one by one through the pipeline. So we're a push model, they're a pull model. Uh, there was some idea that we should have one model. Um, fortunately, uh, Andres Helsberg was part of the review, and he pretty quickly figured out what we were doing, and he understood why we were doing it. And interestingly enough, uh, some significant number of years later, uh, DevDiv ha has the reactive framework, and the reactive framework works by pushing objects through a pipeline. So we felt slightly vindicated. Um, and then we were stuck in the corporate layer. Oh, oops. Somebody noticed that you could build software with PowerShell. Oh, my. Um, so the MS build was new at that time. It was just, uh, just coming out. Uh, Microsoft had invested a, a lot of energy into building these new tools. Visual Studio was notoriously weak on build automation. So it was an automation. It was a tool for automating builds. Um, through mechanisms unknown, someone saw a slide talking about how uh, PowerShell could be used as part of a software construction tool chain. Uh, this was, I think, actually being used. To, the slide deck was used to justify the existence of PowerShell. Look at all the places you can use it. So of course, it tread on somebody's toes. Um, and it's not like it's, that, that idea is unique. I mean, the shells are, have always been part of the programmer's work pan, workbench on Unix. The programmer's workbench is the set of utilities make and so forth for building software. So it's not unexpected that PowerShell should be able to do this. Um, but uh, we uh, had a review. And it was a review. Um, in the end, it actually, it, it, we, we sort of clarify the relative roles of things um, by kind of like MS Build is like Ant and PowerShell is like Sh and you know and Make is like Make and once people understood sort of the relative roles of the tools, um, we we got through that little hurdle without dying. Um. <coughs> and then finally, we're we're through all the hurdles. We're through the gates. We've we've had our reviews. Um, oh yeah, I forgot the, the first monad virus thing. Uh, or, no, it was the first Vista virus where some uh, kid in somewhere, this, it, this, this guy wrote self-replicating code. He wrote it in every language. He, like, he liked explore, using this to explore new languages. And so he wrote the same self-replicating virus that he wrote in, in you know, C Sharp or VB or Unix shell, he wrote it in PowerShell just to see if you could do it. And somehow this got picked up by the, the security uh, community um, in probably like on a Sunday morning after a big party uh, when nobody's thinking clearly. <laughs> and it got promoted in a big article. And this just started a huge firestorm. Uh, so again, had to, had to calm everyone down, uh, publish the appropriate discussions, explaining what was going on. Um, and again, another shipping hurdle was passed. Uh, but you know, blood pressure, the, uh, in that last period, blood pressure was going up and down like a yo-yo. Um, so finally, we're at the end. There's one teeny thing left we have to fix. Marketing has decided that we will rename Monad, which everybody loved, to Windows PowerShell, uh, which was not as well received. Um, and it had to be Windows PowerShell. It couldn't be PowerShell because there were other things that used PowerShell. If we wanted to get a trademark, it had to be Windows PowerShell. So, and we had to change it in the code. We had to change it everywhere. Everywhere where they're physical, visible, but also a lot of places in the code where things might be visible through reflection. And so, with a bunch of scripts and a whole lot of scanning later, um, every, everything got cleaned up. <coughs> uh, well, almost everything. You will still see in the code, uh, like the fact that the PS object, the you know, core of our type system, is stored in a file called MSH object. Uh, you'll see, you'll see, still see bits and pieces of that. And, uh, ah, thank you. Uh, so anyway, shipping is fun, and now we're ready to ship. Yay! And finally, we have shipped. Um, PowerShell 1 shipped in 2006 uh, to great acclaim and huge size of relief. And we've been going steady ever since. 
Um, and that's all the time I have based on, oh boy, I'm way over. Uh, so uh, again, I, I uh, encourage you, based on what you've heard today, if there are things that I haven't answered uh, or things that you'd like more information on, please let me know. Uh, I should have had my, all my stuff in the back. Long deck. Ah, yes, about me. So my email is here. Uh, was there? Come on. Stay. Okay. Yes. Yes, I jitters. Um, my email, my Twitter. Uh, handle. Um, you know, let me know uh, the stuff stuff that you think I should cover. Things, stuff that you think I should cover in more detail. Stuff I should cover in less detail. Stuff I should emit completely. Uh, please let me know. Anyway, so thank you. <laughs>